paid for the whole year. And it was like a, a 120, 130 bucks or something like that. Oh, that's not expensive. That's not no, bad. right. And that could go, if the meeting goes over an hour, yeah. know, as long as I want. Where if I did the free one, I only had 40 minutes. Right. I think yeah. We are live. Hey. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yep, we are. Okay, I see the live on Facebook on okay, the corner. Yeah. So. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go on my phone because if they comment. Okay. Oh, that's not it. If they comment, I could read them to you. So I'll do it on my phone. Okay. Yeah, so just give me one sec. Because I won't be able to see it on here. Right. Yeah, they should integrate it somehow that they, you know, that you can see Facebook chat on there. Right. You'd think that they would do that. Maybe it's coming. Somehow that they, okay, know, let they me lower this. See. Okay. There we go. All right. Okay. We should be getting some viewers. We'll wait for a little bit to get us some okay. of people. Hello, guys. I see a few of you guys are coming on. Thank you for watching. Thank you for coming on and watching. Thank you for supporting this Thriving in Hope with Juanita and hearing all the different stories from all my lung cancer brothers and sisters. I try to do this weekly. But next week, I am going to give myself a break. I'm not going <laughs> to next week. My husband's um, birthday's next week and he took the week off. So we got to um, clean out the garage and move my equipment out of the gym to the garage. So I got a lot of things to do. So I will take a break next week and then start back up. There you go. Yeah. So did you, were you able to share it? Me? Yeah. Um, let me see if I can go and share it. Like, yeah, share it on your page. Okay. Oh, great. See it on my phone. It, it's like, um, oh, there it goes. Okay. Okay. That's not hello, what I hello, to hello. For those that are watching, thank you for joining us. This is Julie. She's going to share her, her journey living with lung cancer. Share this with other lung cancer groups or invite other lung cancer brothers and sisters in case they forgot or share with anybody. It doesn't matter who you share with because a story is a story and these stories could bring hope and inspiration not only to lung cancer survivors and cancer survivors, but to others. Hey, Ivy. Thank you for watching. Oh, Ivy. <laughs> so Ivy is a friend of mine I grew up with. Um, I think it was high, sc high school. And um, yeah, she, uh, we've been friends ever since. Um, Uh, let's see. I'm just gonna. I just shared it to. Okay. Welcome, guys. Thank you for joining. We're getting some people now. Yeah. Thank you for joining. Thank you for supporting. Share. It is important to educate many people of lung cancer. I see Shelly says hi. <laughs> Who does? Shelly. See, I don't I don't see it on mine. You don't oh I'm doing it as a watch party. I don't know if that's oh, why. okay. No, that's fine. That's fine. No, that's fine. So if you're doing it as a watch party and then uh, make sure you look at the comments. Okay. Because since you started a watch party, they, they might comment on there. Okay. Yeah, I have it up yeah. on my and then phone. you can answer the questions. <laughs> Just a caveat, so, we don't know what, I, or I don't know what I'm doing. It's then, okay, so. it's okay. <laughs> so guys, if you have any questions for Julie, make sure you comment. Now she started a watch party. So whoever's looking at the watch party, go right ahead. 
And if you're just watching it regular on my page, and then I'll see it on my phone here and I'll just let her know. All right. So I'm going to put this phone down. So thank you guys for joining. Thank you guys for watching. Thank you guys for supporting. Uh, this is Julie. Uh, she is one of my lung cancer sisters. Yes, we're a big, huge family. <laughs> we're, <That's all> right. <laughs> we're not blood related, but we're related. <laughs> we share one thing. Hey, Lisette, we share one thing, and that's lung cancer. Mm -hmm. Shally, stage four, correct? Yep, I was diagnosed um, stage four, correct. So stage four, and look, she looks great. Uh, we all yeah. look great. We don't <laughs> look like them Hollywood cancer patients. No, maybe I look like that when I went through chemo, but I, I look I look good now. I gained a little weight, you know. <laughs> Julie looks awesome and amazing. So, guys, this is Julie. I'm going to let her take it away. She is going to share with you all her story, her journey living with lung cancer. Um, mm -hmm. Julie, have you, um, have you done any advocacy work? You know, talk about that as well. Um, when you're done with that, just share it with people. Like when you were diagnosed, what gave you hope and what gives you hope now? And words of encouragement, words of wisdom, um, words of hope. And sure. these words are not only for lung cancer patients and survivor guys, it's for all of us. We can learn from hearing these stories because you might not be going through lung cancer. You might be going through something else in your life, you know, yourself or a parent or a grandparent or a child. But these stories and they just bring hope. So mm -hmm. if we made it this far and we look great and we're living and surviving and your storm is not as big as ours and then you can too. Mm hmm wanted to let you guys know that. So go ahead, Julie, take it away. Okay, so um, to start with my story, I think we have to go back to like 2016. I was, it was probably March of 2016, mm -hmm. and I started this having this cough. And, you know, it was around the time that allergies start kind of emerging. And so I thought, okay, maybe I'm just getting allergies. And I you know, have to increase my allergy medication, but the cough just wouldn't go away. And um, <clears throat> for a couple of weeks, I was coughing and I was going to go to Chicago actually to visit one of my best friends or my best friend in Chicago. And she, uh, before I went out there, I'm like, well, I, I wonder if I'm coming down with something because this isn't just, it's just not going away. And so I went to urgent care and they, um, they did an x-ray on me and they said, Oh, you have pneumonia. And I was like, mm. okay, I have pneumonia. I mean, I felt fine other than the cough, but, um, you know, they did an x-ray right away and, um, gave me some antibiotics and sent me on my way. And mm -hmm. so I took the course of antibiotics and, of course it did nothing. And so I went back to my primary. Um, so this is my second visit mm -hmm. and they're like, well, let's do another x-ray. So they do another x-ray they still see um, a spot in my lungs. Uh, and they said, well, you know, pneumonia can take six to eight weeks to clear up. So just give it time. So they said, here, take some steroids and see if that helps. So uh, I, take the steroids home. I try them. Um, I'm by the end of May, this went on for, you know, a good six to eight weeks. Mm -hmm. By the end of May, I was at my wit's end because I could not stop coughing. Mm -hmm. It was just getting worse and worse. I mean, my family was, I was driving my family nuts because I was coughing mm -hmm. so much. So um, I finally called my primary and I said, I know this isn't the eight week window, but I have to come in. There's something wrong. Um, so they brought me back in and I said, you know, can you do a CT scan or something? Because something is not right. And right. my primary was like, well, let's do another x-ray again. Um, so he did another x-ray and he's like, oh, it looks like it looks a little bit bigger. So then he's like, okay, we'll do a CT scan. So finally I got my CT scan. And, um, you know, went on my way. And to be honest, I was, you know, I worked in the school at the time and I was 
doing my own little research and I was like, oh my gosh, I probably have tuberculosis and this is going to make news because, you know, I'm in a school setting. And so that's what I was thinking. And of course I saw, you know, in my Google searches, the lung cancer diagnosis, but I was like, there's no way, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I don't, I didn't think I had any risk factors. Um, So in any case, I, uh, I went to work the next day and I got a call right away in the morning. Um, and my doctor's like, you need to come into my office. And I was like, why? Um, and he's like, and bring your husband. And I, and then I, I just knew right when he said that, that it wasn't good. I said, it's cancer, isn't it? And he's like, yes. So, um, we went in to my, um, primary, my husband and I, and, um, we got the referral to go to an oncologist and so um, went and had my biopsy, um, you know, and of course I was just scared um, beyond belief because mm-hmm. I, I didn't believe that this was happening to me. I was 41 years old at the time. Um, so what, you know, relatively young right. and um, to have cancer in my lungs. So in any case, I went to a, a local hospital here in Minnesota, um, and they, you know, did the biopsy and sent it out, sent it out for um, genetic testing, and it came back a couple of weeks later that I had um, EGFR uh, lung cancer, and I was stage four because it had spread to my lymph nodes. I had it in my breastbone, and then I had it in both lungs. So by the time we found it, it was already stage four. And of course, the only symptom I had um, was the coughing. Yep. So, um, you know, it's, it was sneaky. I had no idea. And, um, you know, unfortunately was diagnosed at stage four when it was, you know, too late to find a cure or to have a cure. So that was the first, um, I guess, phase of my journey. And I, so I went on, um, a drug called erlotinib, which is also known as Terceva. Um, mm-hmm. And that um, was, it's, at that time, it was first line um, approved for stage four EGFR lung cancer. And I had a great, a great um, reaction to that. All of my, um, most of my nodules in my lung um, were eliminated and the um, bone met in my breastbone completely resolved. Um, and I just had one stubborn tumor in my right lower lobe. So I I wrote down these dates so I would remember them. Um, so in April of 2017, so this is almost a year later after Mm -hmm. I'm on Tarceva for nine months, um, I had a right lower lobe wedge resection of my Mm -hmm. lung. So just about the size of a fist, um, Mm -hmm. of my right lower lobe. Um, and you know, I was in the hospital for just a couple days, I thought the, my recovery was super easy. I don't know why it was just, um, it was a really easy surgery for me. I was biking, um, the next week with my son. Wow. So yeah, um, it was, and I will say that before I did the surgery on the advice of my therapist, I did mm-hmm. some guided imagery on success of surgery. So I'm mm-hmm. a believer now <laughs> on guided meditation. So, um, and anyway, uh, I continued after the wedge resection, I continued on Tarceva. Um, and at that point, my, um, I was considered um, NED or no evidence of disease. So awesome. yeah, um, that being said, um, I'm, you know, just trucking along, I, I backing up, I did um, decide Tarceva was really tough. Um, mm-hmm. I was losing my hair, um, the digestive issues, the fatigue, Um, it was really, really hard on my, myself. And I was still trying to work full time at that time Mm. um, and be a parent to my eight and 10 year old um, and a wife to my husband. So it was, it was really challenging. And I, I loved my job. I worked in a high school. I was the CFO of a high school, um, but I couldn't take care of myself and take care of my job and feel good at the same time. I was, I was just run down. I felt horrible all the time. I didn't have any energy for anyone but work. Um, and so I made the decision to, um, resign my position and, um, you know, just focus on my health. So that was, and, and, you know, we talk about the, 
the um, shock of cancer. I mean, the shock of right. losing kind of my livelihood and my passion was really hard as well. So, um, you know, there were a couple of losses there. It wasn't just that I had cancer. It was that everything that else, everything else that went with it with, you know, right. losing the job and, or not losing the job, but priority, prioritizing um, my health right. at the expense of my job. So, um, in any case, I, so because of the Tarsiva being so tough and I just needed more um, time with my family and energy with my family, um, you know, I, I quit my job and continued on the Tarsiva train um, until about February of 2018. So, and this, what happened in February was kind of a fluke as well. I started having pain in my left leg just a little soreness. Um, it was um, just tender and like a muscle ache, like when you've worked out a little too hard and right. your, your muscles hurt. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I ended up, um, you know, talking to some other lung cancer friends and they were like, well, maybe you have a blood clot in your leg and you should go to urgent care. And um, so I did. And they took an x-ray. <laughs> Um, and the, ex the radiologist came back that my x-ray was fine, but my doctor or the, the, um, urgent care doctor, knowing my history took another look at it. And she asked the radiologist to reread it. And there was a six centimeter tumor in my left femur, um, oh. and in part of my knee. So we sent all my information down to Mayo. Um, I had a biopsy of my leg. They were a little confused because, you know, I had no disease anywhere else, um, but in my left leg. So they were actually thinking that might have been a new primary cancer, like a bone cancer. Okay. Um, but after the biopsy, it came back that it was lung adenocarcinoma that had metastasized to my left femur. Now, the interesting thing here is that when I had my initial PET scans, when I was mm -hmm. diagnosed and, you know, my um, progress PET scans, all of them are eye to thigh. Well, my tumor was outside of the zone because it was in my lower left femur. So it never captured my uh, PET scan. Uh, so we didn't know if this was um, progression, if, if you know, the medicine mm -hmm. had stopped working or if this was initially um, already there when I was diagnosed back in June mm -hmm. of 2016. So my oncologist wanted to be safe and decided to um, basically assume that it was progression. So at that time, I um, switched from Tarsiva, my first line of treatment, to Tegriso, which had then okay. um, become approved as first line treatment. So, okay. and Tegriso was definitely less um, toxic, I would mm -hmm. say. Um, I, I wasn't tied to the bathroom at all times and yeah. you know I, the fatigue was there a little bit um but not quite as severe so um so I had the leg surgery I had radiation I had about 10 rounds of radiation and and honestly the leg surgery was very traumatic for me because um you know I was immobile for months and Ooh. um it was really hard because, right. you know, you go from being this active person and doing stuff and taking care of your kids and yes. to using a walker and not even be able to, you know, walk 20 feet. So it, it was hard. It was really, really hard, not only, you know, physically, but emotionally. Right. So, um, so after that, um, you know, I continued on to Grisso for probably six more months. And then my scans in September of 2018 showed some activity in lymph nodes again. So we kind of um, decided to up my Tegriso and see if a double dose of it would impact um, those lymph nodes. And, you know, it didn't really do any reduction, but it didn't, um, you know, they just remained somewhat stable. They were increasing little incrementally each time, but not to the point where it was considered additional progression, but it wasn't regression either. Okay. So we kept on um, Tegriso and doubled it up. And um, finally, in I want to say September or 
October, I, I, I want to say, I don't know what month it was. Um, we did a bronchoscopy to see if there was any um, additional mutations that my cancer had um, mutated to so that we could target that with an additional medication. Mm -hmm. Well, um, my bronchoscopy that I had at Mayo um, failed because they didn't get enough tissue to do, they got enough tissue to, to confirm that the lymph node was cancerous, but they didn't get enough tissue to send it for genomic testing to see if there was any mutations. So okay. we were kind of back to square one and um, just staying on to, to Gristle. So we continued to do this and then at the same time, I decided to seek out a, a second opinion for a bronchoscopy um, at the University of Chicago, uh -huh. because I had found out that A, they do their um, genomic testing in-house and they uh, require a smaller sample size than Foundation One Medicine does. Uh -huh. So I did a bronchoscopy in Chicago in January of 2019, so a little over a year ago. Um, and we found that I had acquired a MET amplification um, mm. mutation in addition to my EGFR mutation. So my cancer outsmarted, you know, my system. And so now mm. I'm taking two targeted therapy medications, um, Tegriso for the EGFR. And then we added Prozotinib or Zalcori for the MET amplification. And okay. Um, I continue to have progression. Um, in fact, um, you know, the lymph nodes were active in my chest, but now it's moved down to my abdomen. I just had a biopsy actually um, two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Yes, almost three weeks ago now um, down at Mayo um, with a lymph node right near my kidney. Um, so it's getting closer to some other vital organs here. Mm -hmm. um, and the biopsy just came back. I, I, you know, I still have med amplification. I still have EGFR. So at this point, I'm at a crossroads with what I'm going to do with my treatment. My oncologist wants me to go to max dosage of both the Tegriso and the Zelcori, which is going to be rough, mm -hmm. um, or explore a clinical trial, which, you know, so right now I'm basically weighing my options on, okay. you know, what I want to do and kind of doing a little research and probably going to seek out a second opinion as well. So, so that's been my journey. Um, it's been almost four years. Um, you know, when I was diagnosed, um, I'll, I'll say that my mom was diagnosed with stage four kidney cancer when I was 22 years old and she died between the time she was diagnosed and the time that she died, it was three months. So when I was given a stage four lung cancer diagnosis back in 2016, that's what my head went to immediately right. was, I'm going to die within three months. So to be here for almost four years later is incredible to me. Like right. I didn't think that this was going to be, um, I mean, I was in a very dark place. I would say when I was first diagnosed, I mean, we hadn't you know, my oldest was 10, my youngest was eight. We were making plans for me not to be here. Right. Um, you know, doing all the dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's and, you know, making sure everything was in place for them when I was gone and never did I imagine that I'd still be here. So mm -hmm. um, I feel very lucky, but um, I also, um, you know, feel that there's still so much more that needs to be done because, you know, I'm at the crossroads again and I don't know what to do from now on. You know, there isn't like a a laid out plan for me anymore where there was for the first couple of years with treatment. Now it's kind of just, okay, we'll see if this works and see if this works. And if it right. doesn't, then we got to figure something else out. So I, I feel a little bit, um, I definitely feel the anxiety going up and the uh, uncertainty just because of that, because there's not a set um, treatment plan, which, which gets scary. So right. um but you know, I mean, as you know, there's so many other lung cancer people who have kind of paved the way and um, have done the clinical trials and have done um, lots of research and, and there's so much information out there. And so I'm so thankful to be part of such a great community because mm -hmm. I do have a wealth of information at my fingertips um, right. in order to figure out what, sh what should I do next. So. Right. But yeah, so um, 
Let's see here. I guess you wanted to know kind of my advocacy. Yeah. Um, but be so, be yeah, before we go, go into that, um, let's let's explain to some of our viewers that are not familiar with lung cancer. And, you know, I, I'm looking at mine and I got some that are friends that are just, you know, watching and, and they know lung cancer because of me, because I'm always talking about it. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me for, but those, you know, she talks, she's talking about a gene mutation and she's talking about targeted therapy. I just wanted to let you guys know that lung cancer is very complicated. Um, mm -hmm. There are so many gene mutations out there. The, the top three is the one that she has. That's the EGFR. A lot of people get diagnosed with that one. And then mm -hmm. ALK, A -L -K, but we say ALK positive. And then it's ROS1. Then you have, like she said, she had another mutation, MET, M-E-T. Then you have RET, R-E-T. Then you have KRAS. And then you have all these other ones. Mind you, it's lung cancer and it's not small cell lung cancer, but because we, our tumors have these mutations, it's different. So what I take is not gonna help hers and what she mm -hmm. takes is not gonna help mine. That's how complicated lung cancer mm -hmm. is. Then you have small cell and that's even worse. Mm -hmm. And there's really nothing out there. The only thing that works for that is what? Chemo and radiation. And now they're coming up with, with treatment for small cell, but it's usually non-small cell, which is ours. Now, I just wanted to stress to my viewers, research is very important. I cannot stress that enough. Research, because of research and because of friends and family that donate for fundraisers and give, even if it's $10, you don't know how far that $10 will go. And mm -hmm. I have 10 friends that give $10 and then their friends give. I'm, what I'm saying is that it is so important. Her mom passed away of kidney cancer three months. Boom, back then, they, they didn't mm -hmm. have the treatments today. Mm -mm. She's stage four, guys. She was diagnosed. I was diagnosed at stage three. She was diagnosed at stage four. And you hear her story. You know, it's one thing after another, progression. It keeps coming back. Now it's here, now it's there. So, and you heard her, she's running, basically there's no plan. She ran out of options. So now they're going to go with, okay, well, you know, like she said, okay, well, we'll try this, we'll try that. But that shouldn't have to be. She should be able to be like, boom, okay, this next, boom. Okay, that one. But, but EGFR, really, they don't. We have more elk than EGFR. We have more treatments. Now, targeted therapy is a pill that we take instead of going through chemo and radiation, is a pill that we take that targets that specific gene mutation in our tumor. So hers targets her GF, EGFR mutation. Mine targets out. But guys, after a while, it becomes, it, it, the cancer cell gets used to it. So guess what? It starts um, progressing and then it'll move somewhere in, in our body. Hers went to her darn leg. Mine's went to my brain. But prior to that, mine went to my liver. So what I'm trying to make you guys understand, we look good. Yes, we feel good. But this is our life. Every time we go in three months for a CT scan, MRI, an annual PET scan or whatever, this is what we face every single time. It is not over for us. It is mm -hmm. over for Julie. Her kids are still young. Mine's are at least older. Now I want to live for my granddaughter. This is our life. Mm -hmm. And because we look good and we feel good, doesn't mean that we don't go through the anxiety. We don't go through the doubt. We don't go through the uncertainty. We, you know, yes, we still get depressed. Yes, we, you know, but we have each other to uplift us because we know how the other one is feeling. Mm -hmm. I know it's feeling because I've been there. And it came back. So I went right back to that, so, you know, right back to that, you know, dark place for a little bit. I had to get myself out of there. So research matters, guys. And I'm, the reason I'm explaining this and saying this is because when you see something out there that we're raising money for lung cancer, please donate. I don't care if you donate a dollar. Donate something because of your donations and because of funding and research, 
Now Julie has made it to four years. I'm going to make it to six years. So I'm explaining this to let you know the importance of funding, of donating, giving, the importance. And because of you guys, we are living longer. And mm -hmm. I want to stress that. I don't know why I just felt like I had to say that. I wanted to stress that because Julie wants to see her um, her kids graduate high school. And she mm -hmm. wants to see them get married. And she wants to meet her grandbabies. So mm -hmm. Help us. And I do these interviews so you guys could see here, I mean, that's what I see us too, but hear the stories of how we live each day, month after month, year after year, with the fear of this darn lung cancer. Mm -hmm. That's why I wanted to, you know, you know, explain that and stress it out. So yes, now, Julie, tell me um, if you do any advocacy work, uh, talk a little bit about that. Um, before I get into that, I just want to add to what you said about um, research. So my um, first line of treatment was approved, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago for my mutation. But my second line of treatment was just FDA approved in 2018. So Tegriso was just approved in 2018 uh -huh. as first line treatment. The MET, um, the MET amplification targeted therapy was approved for expanded access so that I could take it and it wasn't just for ALK or I think it was ALK or ROS1 um, was it approved for MET back in 2016. So this is not like, uh, you know, this research is recent and this, um, this activity is recent. So, I mean, if I would have been um, in my same situation 10 years ago, this, I would not be here for sure. Right. Right. So, um, you know, research, we are constantly watching the clinical trials, the research mm -hmm. to see, okay, what's up and coming and what can I get on and what can I do? So, right. and, if, and if people don't think that their, their money is going to have an impact, it does. It hasn't had an impact on me. It's had an impact on you. Um, mm -hmm. it, it matters. So, yes. Um, yes, it does. Yes. So back to um, advocacy. Um, I think my advocacy started basically um, within a couple of weeks after I was diagnosed, I was floored um, with my diagnosis. And I was like, this isn't, I, I can't, I can't let my story or my situation um, just kind of fester with me. I have to mm -hmm. share my story. I have to let people know um, because if I was shocked, um, then there's other people who just have no idea that lung cancer can impact anyone, anytime, any age, mm -hmm. um, any gender, whatever. Um, right. And, you know, you need to know that there, smoking is not the only risk factor for lung cancer. There's so many other risk factors. And I happen to have a lot of them. Um, and that, you know, people often think that lung cancer patients are old and smokers and you know like we're the faces of lung cancer there are mm -hmm. so many people who look just like us who have lung cancer and so i've just felt it that i needed to raise awareness no matter how many people i shared my story with if it was just a few mm -hmm. if it was a couple if it was 10s 20s whatever at least i could um know that i've done my part to, to raise awareness. So um, within the first couple months, I attended my first um, patient forum. So mm -hmm. that's really where I learned a lot more about my disease and mm -hmm. connected with other advocates um, to kind of see how, um, how, what the path for advocacy was, um, mm -hmm. just, just meeting um, other people and, um, you know, getting involved with the online support groups on Facebook. Um, there were lots of, especially back in 2016, lots of activity um, within the longevity um, support groups. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, continuing on, I reached out to a local um, organization here in Minnesota called the Breath of Hope Lung Foundation. Mm -hmm. And I walked in and I said, put me to work. Um, I want to help. <laughs> So I've been a um, active volunteer slash worker there since 
2016, really, since I was diagnosed. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, you know, I don't work full time anymore, but it gives me some work to do. And that right. gives me work to do in an area that I'm passionate about. So right. it's very rewarding. And, um, you know, I, I like what I do. So within, you know, a breath of hope. I've searched on their research committee um, for um, research dollars that get mm -hmm. funded to U.S. institutions for exactly lung cancer research to, to keep um, finding options for us. I have been on their speakers bureau. Um, I also served on the Department of Defense Lung Cancer Research Program, so mm -hmm. are reviewing at a national level um, as a patient advocate research um, applications from various U.S. institutions. Mm -hmm. um, what else have I done? Um, you know, I've been, I guess, interviewed on some um, different magazines and um, just to, trying to educate and share my story. So right. uh, just, yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I've been doing for yeah, advocacy. That's good. Yeah. Um, and, you know, sometimes I always feel like, oh, I should be doing more and I should be doing more. But um, you know, it's, it's rewarding when I get to talk to someone and share kind of my experience and my right. um, advice, because I had the same thing done to me when I was first diagnosed. And the, the words of advice and words of wisdom were invaluable mm -hmm. to me. And that's really, really where I felt hope um, is by connecting with other um, advocates, other patients, and seeing that they were living their lives and surviving and living with yes. lung cancer. And so I knew mm -hmm. that I could do the same. So yeah, exactly. so that's yeah. kind of, um, kind of my story. Uh, it's a, it's a, uh, don't want to say a great story because it's not great having lung cancer, but because of lung cancer, I met so many wonderful people like yourself and became friends and became family. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it, in a good, bad way, <laughs> that makes right. in a good, bad way, um, it, you know, I wouldn't have never met you guys and built this friendship. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you could be in Minnesota and I could be in Indiana, but you know, we're still there and like each right. other's comment, I mean, post and comment and message each other and hey, you know, it's, we're there for each other and, and yeah it, it's it's an amazing story because you're you're fighting and you're going to continue to fight because you want to be here for your children and mm -hmm. and you and I and so many of us give the newly diagnosed lots of hope mm -hmm. right basically they hear our stories oh wow you're going four years oh you're going to six years ten years right it's like that just like you could literally see their face light up okay they made mm -hmm. it that far I have a chance and so that's why I do I do these you know yeah so I want to I want to share a story um back in you know September of, or I think it was August of 2016 right after I was diagnosed I flew out to Colorado mm -hmm. um for a patient summit and I can't remember I think um can't remember the organization that put it on, but it, um, it was a smaller organization, but um, out there, you know, I was freshly diagnosed. I was beside myself, but I met Linnea Olson there okay. and she had told me, you know, she, at that time, I think it was 11 years, her stage four diagnosis was given to her and she, her kids were eight and 10 and 11 or something, you know, right around the same right. age my kids were. And she's, she told me, she's like, she looked at me and she said, I just saw my son graduate high school. And I just burst out crying because, yeah. you know, I mean, even just thinking about it right now, it just gets, um, you get a little, you know, you want that for yourself exactly. and for your children. And, um, you know, that's the, that's the thing I hope that I can stick around for. Is oh, you will, honey. You just got to have see it. that. You got to so, have that. Girl, you gotta have that faith. You gotta have that <laughs> positive mindset. Set yeah. up and say, right. I, and every day I'm gonna see my kid graduate. I'm gonna see my kid every day. Say it, and I promise you, you're gonna be there. And then I'm gonna see pictures on Facebook with you <laughs> and your son, right, son? I yeah, I have two boys. Owen two is boys. Uh, Owen is 14 now. 
So yeah. he, um, and then Charlie is 12. So okay, so you're gonna yeah, see and, both the boys. Right, and I'll see my oldest go to high school next year or in exactly. the fall. Well, maybe, it's... maybe it'll be online, who knows, but right? <laughs> oh, I know, right? <laughs> but look, but yeah. you're gonna see, and I, I'm gonna see a picture of you holding him with him with his cap, his gown, that diploma, and you're gonna say, I, I, I got to see this milestone. And then you're gonna set another goal. Now on to the next, and you're gonna yes. make it there. Yeah, I, I know it's rough, I know. You know, we it, all, it, reality. We, you know, we gotta think, yeah, we think reality, but at the same time, I'm like, you know, you know, I'm a faithful woman, so I say no. I always say, God, your word said this, and I expect that. I literally say that. You yep. life, I expect life. You said you're gonna heal, I expect my healing. You I command it, you know. So yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the things too, I think for me, I mean, my faith has has definitely strengthened um, mm -hmm. you know, through this journey. And, you know, at the very beginning, I felt a little bit abandoned by God and a little bit um you know, hurt. And I, again, I had this revelation. I was sitting at work, taking a nap because I was exhausted mm -hmm. and I was crying and I was listening to some music and it was, it was spiritual music. And I was asking God, I said, where, where are you? And then, excuse me, I get a little, it's uh, okay. about this too, because it was just, it's okay. it's like this aha moment that I mean, so many people had reached out to help me and help my family. And, and it was like, hello, Julie, it's all the people around you helping you and showing up for you and, you know, moving you along this path. And that was just like a real enlightenment. Like right. God was sending his angels to me through other people and to be able to um, recognize that and appreciate that. It was just like, it was it was kind of a game changer for me, actually. Right. No, so, yeah. yeah, and, you know, um, I mean, we speak about hope and, um, and, you know, the fact that we, we want to make it to our children's graduation and big events and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But there's also, you know, the reality is, you know, until we find a cure, we have to prepare, you know, um, for things maybe to take a turn. And so... I've been trying to balance both and that that is definitely mm -hmm. a juggling act because you don't want to be um, not, uh, I guess, hopeful, but you also want to be realistic. So there's, right. there's, you know, it, it's working with therapy, it's working, you know, working on your inner right. thoughts and, um, and then also just believing God has a plan. And exactly. I firmly delete, believe that. And um, you know, one of the things I keep on telling myself is that no matter what happens to me, I will be okay, no matter what. So, and that reassures me um, mm -hmm. and provides me with a little bit of sanity when I need it. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, I get it because I, I was like that and I was like, no, yeah, it's reality, but that's not my reality. And mm -hmm. it was extremely hopeful and with extremely high big faith my faith was like no one could break it until I was told ah you got two small spots in your brain and then I just like and then I just realized okay yeah it's good to be hopeful and to you know bring that standard up here that makes sense you know and and say okay yeah no that's not my reality my reality is that I'm going to live 20 more years or whatever and I right. still have that reality I'm gonna live but yeah. I don't know that just like I was four years Ned and then boom two small spots in your brain Juanita automatically went to stage four and I'm like why am I stage four they're small I should be stage one right because it's in your brain it's automatically stage four I was like what the heck so it kind of yeah I'm still hopeful I still you know yeah but at the same time like you said balance it being right. hopeful and reality so knowing that okay it's there it hasn't grown it's stable but like you said one minute it could turn for the worse right oh and that's the well, uncertainty and, 
Right. And we've seen that with our friends, right? Like one month they are fine. And then the next yes. month they're in hospice. And it's, yes. you know, I have a, a, a good friend up here who's in hospice right now. And it's, it's heartbreaking to see our friends dying. Right. I mean, um, so while we say that we have lots of hope and we have lots of um, progress with research, there's still so much more that needs to be done, which is yes. why we need these interviews and which is why we need more research dollars and Right. Why we need people to kind of say, hey, this isn't just a smoker's disease. This is anyone's disease. And yes. pay attention. Look at us. Look at us right now who, you know, are dying of this disease. Yes. Um, so, yeah, I mean, whatever, whatever I can do to help that along, I will do it because, right. you know, it may not impact my past, but it would impact someone exactly and, see, and that's what we need we need more people okay i understand yeah you're, you're uncertainty you're doubtful you're scared you're nervous but i do this i don't do this and i don't go av do advocacy work and i don't go to all the i don't do it for me yes i do but i also do it for everyone else that's impacted mm -hmm. lung cancer because like you said it might might not help me but at least when I'm gone, my children, my husband, my grandchildren, my, you know, my granddaughter, if I have more grandchildren, they could say, you know what? Because of my grandma, because of my mom, mm -hmm. what happened? It didn't work for my mom, but look, because of what she did, it impacted the rest of the lung cancer community. And because of my mom, this is what's going on. Or because of grandma, she made this happen, or she was a part of this. You know what I'm right. saying? Exactly. Yeah. Do I do it for me? Yeah, of course I do. But because I see so many of our brothers and sisters dying, like we just mm -hmm. saw one in, in the Illinois area, in Illinois, in my area. I'm in Indiana, but I'm so close to Illinois in mm -hmm. Chicago. Um, she was, she just posted a video yesterday. And then um, one of our, one of my lung cancer sisters, Crystal, Calls and tells me she's gone and I'm like wait I was just messaging her we were just messaging mm -hmm. I don't remember what the message was but we were just messaging and I'm like okay well, once this is over we got to get together let's we meet up and you know go to dinner so I mean it was like she just posted a video yesterday and she's gone right, today. right. that's well, how I, fast I think that's too also I mean people look at us and say, oh, you look healthy, you're, you're cancer free, right? Well, no, we are not cancer free. We have active cancer in our bodies. And it's, you know, things can turn on a dime and people can die within, you know, a few weeks if something goes wrong. And I don't yes. think people realize that, that, no. you know, just because we look like we're um, a picture of health, it, it, we're, exactly. our bodies are actively fighting to live yes. right now. So, exactly. Um, and I, I think that people, I mean, people that see me who haven't seen me for a while are like, oh, you look great. You must be, yes. you know, when did you stop treatment? I'm like, I've never stopped in treatment ever. No. I will be on treatment. I will be on treatment for the rest of my rest life. Of and I, and mm -hmm. pe some people don't understand that, that no, as a stage four, as a stage four patient, you constantly have to be ahead of the game and you yes. have to keep on um, trying to attack the cancer because it's active in your entire body. Yes. So, no, yes, you're, you're absolutely correct. So yes, people, this is our story. This is her story. You know, this is our life. We look, mm -hmm. great, but like she said, we still have active cancer in our bodies and they're just being stabilized because of the treatments that we take. There is no cure. Same with diabetes, same with um, people that have chronic um, kidney disease, same as someone with um, heart problems, they take pills. I mean, it's a chronic, you know, hopefully our disease will become a chronic disease. Um, but as of right now, I just lost a friend that I met at the Lunch and Learn in Chicago in November. My weekend birthday, I went up there, my husband spoke on the panel for the caregiver side. She sat in the table behind me. I met her. She was crying. I hugged her. I told her everything was going to be okay. She met the Chicago girls. We call ourselves the lung cancer babes, the Chicago lung cancer babes. And, um, and she was in a little group on our, 
um, it's a group me little phone number thing. I don't know what you call that thing. It's like a little chat. It's called group me. I don't know. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> we embraced her and, you know, became Facebook friends and talked to each other. And she was fine yesterday and she's gone today. So that is our life. That's what we, you know. And, and, and just because we look great, I hate when this says, oh, you look so good. You don't even look sick. Um, are you cancer free, honey? We look like a million bucks, but we are sick. It's in our body. We live with this every single day. We have good days and bad days. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'm all, I live in the bathroom. I, I, we're adults here. I keep, I keep it real. Yep. <laughs> I've been going to that bathroom so much that Steve, my husband's like, okay, you need to spray when you're done because it's. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, my pills just you know, right. Um, you can't control you know, it. That yeah, this is we the can't price. control it. Mm -hmm. It's so bad. I mean, you know, I'm not gonna lie. I've had accidents, and I feel like an 80 year old. Mm -hmm. There was a, but it's it's keeping me alive. A, there was a point in time that I was wearing adult diapers because yes, it was so too. bad. And exactly. you know, I'll admit it. I'm not ashamed of it. This is right. this is a. This is cancer, right? Right. I mean, this is what it is. And exactly. Like you said, we're all adults. Yeah. So, um, so um, you know, it's that's one of the side effects. Mm -hmm. I'll go through it. So, you know, when I do my uh, here in, in, in Northwest Indiana, Chicagoland, when I do my little Zumbathon for lung cancer, please, 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 I only charge 20 bucks, guys. Come on, you could give that. Um, so poor, because trust me, they use that money for research. They, if there's a young investigator, um, and those are the, the researchers, but they're like starting off or they have a plan or something. And so they invest in them and they give the money to them. And they're there in their labs researching medicine for us to help us live longer. And a lot of that money does go. I've been to so many meetings where I sat and in, in front of young investigators and they're talking about, this is my plan. This is what I think would work. And I need, you know, uh, research money to continue my research. I need the funding, I should say, to continue my research because this looks promising. And then boom, all of a sudden, a couple years later, we got the, we got the medical. It mm -hmm. does, trust me, that's why we're living longer. So don't think, oh, a scam, no, we're not a scam. Well <clears throat> And I want to say something too about that. Like with, with research dollars, um, probably a lot of people don't know this, but lung cancer does not get nearly enough yes. money. When you talk about research dollars, they get a small, it's the world's, it's the world's deadliest cancer, but it gets the least amount of research funding um, mm. compared to colon cancer, compared to um, breast cancer, any of the other cancers. You know, we're really low for research dollars from the federal standpoint. Well, one of the things that these research dollars do that, you know, we raise for money for um, these young investigators is that it encourages them to stay in the lung cancer field and not go after just where the money is yes. um, because, you know, they can go to breast cancer and just get a ton of research dollars and not to disparage breast cancer, obviously, because we want right. a cure for breast cancer um, as well. But, um, you know, we need more dollars to lung cancer and all the, you know, researchers need to have funds available in order to spend yes. time on lung cancer research. So, yes. you know, it's not just about finding the next, it's about getting young scientists or brilliant scientists into the field of lung cancer in order yes. to further our field. Exactly. And you're right. You're absolutely right. In order for us to keep them, we got to give them that those those research dollars. They could continue to do what they do best and to keep us alive and healthier. So, yes, I'm glad you brought that up because I, yeah, I totally forgot about that. But, yeah, and what better way to keep them on our side so we could become the next breast cancer? Because right. that would be amazing. Um, yeah, if you Google it, guys, Google it and it tells you the funding, but I'm gonna tell you this that what I do know. So for every person that dies of lung cancer, we literally get over a thousand dollars. That is it. Where breast cancer gets thousands, prostate gets the, uh, thousands, and then is it colon? I think so, yeah. Three, 
Those are the ones that get more money when someone passes away. Breast cancer is number one. I don't even know how many they get, but it's up there. We are at the bottom. We're the last one. And it's for every person. And we have in lung cancer, honestly, I could say this because I mean, not precise, but approximately, you know, it's over 100,000 people would die of lung cancer yearly. Mm-hmm. So for every person that dies, we get a little over 1,000. So what are we getting? A little over $100,000 every year for lung cancer, where breast cancer is probably in the millions. So that's how they treat us. And again, it's that damn stigma about smoking. Mm-hmm. Started with all the smoking this, smoking that. And like Julie said, you don't have to smoke to get lung cancer. You have a pair of lungs, we all do. You could get lung mm-hmm. cancer. It could be secondhand smoking. It could be mm-hmm. pollution. Radon gas is right up there on the top. Mm-hmm. See, who the hell knows? It'd probably be the water we're drinking. I don't know. But, it, you know, that it's, you don't have to smoke to get lung cancer, guys. Mm-hmm. I never smoked. Did you smoke, Julie? I did not smoke. Um, I was, I was, I had the other risk factors though. I was exposed to secondhand smoke. Um, what was I? And I was also exposed to asbestos as a child. And so was um, I. My, right. My, my dad worked in the car industry and, mm-hmm. you know, we all know that the cars, the brakes all had asbestos yes. on them. And he used to, um, you know, come into the house and, you know, I would do his laundry and it had asbestos everywhere. Right. Um, yes. And I, we also had radon in our house that I live okay. in now. So, um, you know, a lot of people don't know that radon is the, yes. the second highest cause of lung cancer um, in the United States. And here in Minnesota, we have very um, radon rich soil. So, oh, you know, okay. it's so important for people to test their Yes. homes for radon and not just on a you know once a year basis you know or one one time basis you want to check right. it every couple of years or right you know, to make sure that you don't have radon because it can yeah. change it can change seasonally it can change yes it can you know, so and how to yeah. test for radon is a kit and i think my husband i don't know if he bought the kit when i was first diagnosed he bought a kit and he tested the house and I don't remember if he got it on Amazon or Walmart, Target. I don't know. He got it somewhere. But you could buy it. You could buy them there. Walmart, Target. Mm-hmm. So, you know, just just test it. You just never know. Just test right. it. Um, and a lot of times, a lot of times, like your state Department of Health, like our Minnesota Department of Health will give them out for free because oh. they know it's such a problem. Right. Um, so, you know, you can contact your Department of Health in your, yes. in your associated and state ask. and see if they have them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's great, great idea. But Julie, thank you so much. Um, God, your this interview was awesome. You gave such a, a good story and great information. Yeah. That, you know, reminded me like, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, because there's so much information out there. Yeah. It's always like a a refresher course for me because I, you know, there's so much out there. I do forget, and I'm like, oh yeah, oh yeah, that's a good yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'm you so know, glad to you, be able to do this. Yes, the, for, for, you know, sh- um, just sharing your story and, and taking Thursday evening at 8 p.m. my time. You're central? No, you're mountain. Yeah, right? I'm, no, I'm central. Oh, so. you're central like me? Oh, yep. okay. Yeah. A- you know, 8 p.m. It's not too late, but it's not too early. Right. For, you know, the evening, spending the evening with me and our viewers. I, I'm truly grateful and I do appreciate it. But before we leave, before we close... Any words of encouragement, inspirational words that you would like to share with the viewers? Um, I guess, you know, for those that are on this journey, like if you're, if you're feeling down and desperate and alone, like just look at the people around you and the people that are, you know, giving you love, giving you support, giving whatever they can to help you. Um, to be, to let them in and let them help you. I mean, that's a, it's a hard lesson to learn, but it's so worth it. And, um, you know, it's, for me, it's really been a show of, you know, my angels here on earth to, Mm -hmm. to, um, to give me like comfort and hope to know that not only will I be taken care of, but my family will be taken care of no matter what happens on this path. So, um, you know, people, 
are amazing and um, you know, there's hope in so many um, different ways to see it, like through, through obviously the medicine that we take, but also mm -hmm. the people that touched our lives, so. Awesome. Well, guys, thank you for joining with us this evening as well. I hope this interview, um, I don't know, going through something gave you some hope, inspire you some way or another. It doesn't necessarily have to be that you have lung cancer. Uh, but anything in life, uh, but these stories will uplift you in whatever storm you're going through in your in your life or what season mm -hmm. in your life. We all go through storms. We all go through seasons. But thank you uh, for watching. And um, next week I am taking a break. It's my husband's on vacation. He took a week off, and it's his week birthday week, so I won't be on next Thursday. Following Thursday, I'll be on. Um, and share this video share it with someone. Maybe you know someone that was just diagnosed with lung cancer and they were just diagnosed with EGFR. This is great information right here. Share it. Uh, I will have it on my YouTube channel for those that don't have Facebook. And I just realized that I forgot to record this. So now I have to, <laughs> I do that all the time. I just realized that. But what I do is I just, um, I download it on my laptop and then I save okay. So I do. I have a folder. So you gotta work, that I, work around. I know. Okay. I have a ha bad habit of doing that. I know. I have to start learning to record. <laughs> but you know, it's on YouTube. So if you know someone that doesn't have Facebook and and all my videos are on my, just hit me up. I don't remember my YouTube channel. I have to look it up. I just never remember. <laughs> I don't. That's I another. Remember. That's another impact of our treatment is I can't yes. remember anything either. Right. <laughs> Chemo brain. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but um, so yeah, I mean, so thank you guys for always, you know, joining me on Thursday night. And um, and I've you know, if you know someone, like I said, just show them this video, guide them to my page or guide them to my YouTube. And if you're a lung cancer patient survivor or any cancer and you want to share your story, please hit me up. And I'm I'm um yeah, I'm, I'm starting to schedule. I think um I got some spots in May and June. So please hit me up. I would love to hear your story. Lung cancer, non-lung cancer, I don't care what cancer you have. It's always good to share your story and educate. I like to learn more about other cancers. So, you know, hit me up and let's schedule you and educate me about your cancer. Okay. Well, again, Julie, thank you so much. Yes, thank you, Juanita. Thank Appreciate you for doing this. Yes, yeah, stay safe out there. Where you I will from people don't go out if you don't have to no i don't i don't healthy. i'm going a little yeah. stir crazy but yeah we all are the good yeah yes and again thank you you have a good evening honey and i will you too see you soon okay bye okay bye guys thank you